welcome to, uh, to real-time rendering for feature film. Um, we'll be presenting a, uh, a case study of some work we at the Lucasfilm Advanced Development Group um, did last year in support of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Uh, today's session is going to be shared um, between the three of us, uh, three speakers. John first is going to, uh, to give an overview of the film itself um, and how this real-time work came to be involved. Then um, I will get into a breakdown of how ADG contributed to Rogue One. Uh, I'll speak to the details of the digital assets involved um, and the workflow for lighting the shots. Then I will hand over to Natty um, to discuss the technical details of rendering this content. Uh, we will also touch on some ongoing work uh, in this area happening at ADG and at uh, ILM XLab. Then we'll close with, uh, with some time for, oh, <laughs> I haven't been doing my bullets. Uh, we'll close with some time for Q&A. Uh, but first, um, I'd like to give some introductions. So since 1986, uh, John has been at Industrial Light and Magic, uh, where he is now Chief Creative Officer and also a, uh, a Senior Visual Effects Supervisor. Um, as John is an avid computer graphics enthusiast and hobbyist, himself. Uh, his shows have always been known to push the state of the art in production CG. John won an Academy Award in 2007 for the visual effects work that he supervised in, uh, in Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. John is not only the visual effects supervisor for Rogue One, uh, but he is also the creative mind behind the original idea for the film. Oh, and uh, by the way, uh, in 1987, John and his brother Thomas uh, created something that you might be familiar with, uh, Photoshop. John, John Noel, everybody. Uh, Natty Hoffman uh, is principal engineer and architect for rendering at the Lucasfilm Advanced Development Group. Um, Natty has a long and storied career on the cutting edge of real-time computer graphics uh, from Westwood, uh, Naughty Dog, Sony, Activision, 2K, and now Lucasfilm. Since around 2004, uh, Natty has been spearheading uh, the transition to practical uh, implementations of physically based shading models across the games industry, um, which I'm sure many here are familiar with. Natty joined the Advanced Development Group at Lucasfilm uh, one year ago in uh, March of 2016. Uh, Nat Natty. <laughs> uh, me, I'm Roger Kordes, uh, Digital Production Supervisor for the Advanced Development Group. Uh, I've been with Lucasfilm since 2010. Uh, I'm one of the founding members of the ADG. Uh, I was the lighting and look dev lead uh, for Star Wars 1313. Um, I am a real-time lighting and uh, look dev specialist with a passion for generating high fidelity images. Uh, one of my dreams is to match ILM quality in real time. Uh, so this work that we're going to be talking about today uh, was an absolute slam dunk for me. Um, we should also introduce a couple of other concepts here, uh, the concept of ILM X Lab um, and of the, uh, the Advanced Development Group. So in 2016, Kathy Kennedy uh, firmly planted a Lucasfilm banner in the world of immersive entertainment uh, with the launch of ILM XLab. XLab brings together the creative forces of um, the Lucasfilm Story Group, of Skywalker Sound, um, Industrial Light and Magic, and of the Lucasfilm Advanced Development Group with a mission to create new premium immersive entertainment experiences that go beyond traditional film and other linear media. As for the Advanced Development Group, we were founded in 2013 uh, to be an innovation center within Lucasfilm focused on real-time rendering. Uh, up next, we'll show a few samples of the kinds of imagery that ADG technology has helped to create. So first, uh, at its core, Lucasfilm is about story. So with that in mind, this first piece is a, a short cinematic that um, the Advanced Development Group put together in mid-2014 to show what real-time rendering, uh, what we thought real-time rendering technology can, uh, can bring to the creative world of storytelling. So. Droids have attacked. 
patrol unit and a blue and white astro mech. They may be attempting a rendezvous here at this outpost. Our ground forces have just engaged a transport that blasted its way out of Mos Eisley. Proceed, but secure the perimeter first. Those droids must not escape. Fan out! Wait for me! Arthur and I are ready for extraction and heading to the rendezvous point. I repeat, we are ready for extraction. Immediately! I've got Imperials all over me, but I'll do what I can. I've called in some backup. That doesn't sound very reassuring. Fighting everywhere, Arthur. Arthur, oh, Arthur, please. I can't keep up. Save yourself. Thank you. So then last year, uh, the Advanced Development Group developed Trials on Tatooine, a, uh, a VR experience um, with which uh, Lucasfilm and Industrial Light Magic launched the ILM X-Lab brand. Uh, and here we have the launch trailer. For Um, this one, this is a uh, high fidelity rendering test that ADG did, um, which kind of leads us into what we'll be talking about today. Um, so with, uh, with those introductions out of the way, I'd like to turn the presentation over to John Knoll uh, to talk to us about this specific real-time project and what it achieved for Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Thank you. Uh, so my challenge to the advanced development group was to, to take this development and use it to create some finished work on a feature film. The specific challenge was to take an ILM production asset, you know, without completely rebuilding it uh, specifically for a game engine and rendering it using the real-time render at a quality level that I can put in the film. Uh, the success story here is that the ADG shots are mixed right in with our RenderMan renders. And we have a short reel of K2SO shots, and it's a mixture of RenderMan renders and ADG renders. So can you spot the difference? Okay. Our optimal route to the data vault places only 89 stormtroopers in our path. We will make it no more than 33% of the way before we are killed. We could transmit the plans to the rebel fleet. We'd have to get a signal up to tell them it's coming. It's the size of the data files, that's the problem. They'll never get through. All right, so uh, we'll play the reel again, but uh, with uh, ADG shots clearly labeled. Okay. Our optimal route to the data vault places only 89 stormtroopers in our path. We will make it no more than 33% of the way before we are killed. We could transmit the plans to the rebel fleet. We'd have to get a signal up to tell them it's coming. It's the size of the data files, that's the problem. They'll never get through. 
All right, so Roger and Natty will present a technical breakdown of how this is all done, but an important question is why? You know, why are we, why is real-time rendering important for Rogue One? And uh, the answer is that, that in visual effects, the, the ability to iterate is crucial. Instant feedback and fast rendering mean more iterations, more creatively useful iterations per day. And a shorter iteration cycle gives us higher quality in fewer hours, and that's, that's why we're chasing this. So about two years ago, and this was back during the production of Force Awakens, I'd seen some early real-time render tests out of the advanced development group that seemed extremely promising. Um, and in uh, early 2015, ADG generated a version of the X-Wing shot that was in the original Thanksgiving trailer for folks, Force Awakens. And ADG had rendered the X-Wing elements in seconds per frame, whereas the ILM software renders, you know, were, for the actual teaser, were multiple hours per frame. And the ADG rendered X-Wings were then put through the exact same compositing step as the, and the results were pretty good. The two versions don't look exactly the same. They're not identical. Um, and there are a number of cheats in the ADG, ADG shot. Like, for example, the area lights are, are crude approximations and the occlusion calculation is a little bit different. But you know, generally, when I, I saw this, I felt like, all right, well, this is something we can, we can work with. Um, then last year, ADG uh, hired uh, Natty Hoffman and, and trusted the future of Lucasfilm's real-time rendering to him. And that uh, gave me even further confidence that this is a uh, direction to, to, to pursue. Um, so we've established uh, ILM X Lab and the ADG as the place within the company where ILM CG artists uh, sit right alongside game industry talent to build these you know, exciting new things. And that's exactly what I needed for this, this project. So the, the challenge to ADG was to take this idea of rendering production quality images um, you know, out, out of experiment uh, and, and testing. You know, I thought uh, what I'd seen was promising enough that uh, all right, well, can we, you know, this looks like we've, we've hit a bar that this could go into a feature film. Um, let's take it out of theory and into practice. Let's do a, a shot. Um, so the, you know, and I, I was pretty upfront that, uh, that we had to hit a level of, uh, of quality that was as good as the render man renders. You know, if it didn't hit that bar, then we couldn't use it. But I was pretty happy um, with how that turned out. I, I think it succeeded pretty well. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, so talking to ADG about uh, you know what we what asset we could try this with, um, you know they, they were looking. Th their ideal case was uh, was a hard surface asset, opaque, um, pretty much like the the X wings, and a, and a perfect uh, candidate for that was uh, was our K two S O character. Um, he's going to be a hard surface asset. He's going to be CG all the way through. Um, and some of the, uh, the, the more difficult shading challenges uh, aren't actually present in the, the character, so it, it would be a good test case to do. Um, and with the unified asset standard um, having been uh, designed and come into fruition between ILM and ADG during the production of Force Awakens, um, it seemed like everything was in place to, to give them a, a crack at this. And so the, the first first step in this process was to mirror a shot that was being done through the traditional pipeline. So we had a shot that was being lit by an ILM uh, lighting TD and render man, and, uh, and that kind of set the, the visual bar, the, the look. If we could hit this, uh, then we could do another, uh, another shot, essentially without a safety net, without a backup plan. Um, so we proceeded in parallel with, uh, with the shot, and once we got to a place where I felt like, you know, we could final that, uh, that element, then they proceeded with, with doing these, these shots with no backup plan. Uh, I'll also say, uh, uh, besides uh, for final shot production, you know, there's an important use of real-time rendering, uh, just working with, uh, with actors. Um, so in pre-production, we had this uh, very uh, sort of crude early version of K2SO uh, that, that ran in real time uh, on our motion capture stage. We had Alan come in for a day, and you know, since the character is very tall, he was standing on uh, on stilts, and so he had had a little time to get used to the stilts, and then uh, this was a chance for him to get on the stage and sort of puppeteer the character, and he could watch himself in real time while he's uh, you know, seeing what what feels right on the character. You know, is it 
Do you do more or less arm swinging? Uh, you know, how loose is your body? What, what feels right in the character? And while this is, you know, a very crude GL, um, uh, the, because this was done, you know, um, in, way in pre-production before we had the final K2SO asset built, um, the, the same asset that we used for the film, we could have flipped the equation. You know, the, the constraint uh, for the film was we had to have very high visual fidelity, can't have any noise, you have to have really smooth motion blur, uh, can't be any visible artifacts, um, but I don't need it to run at 60 frames a second, so I can afford longer render times. Uh, but for this purpose, we could just flip that and you know, impose the, it's gotta run at, uh, at speed, and we could live with a little bit of, uh, of noise in the renders. Um, so we could, in the future, using some of the, the, this new ADG engine, I think it'll make this experience even better. Uh, and with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Roger. So, uh, what, what does it actually mean to, uh, to work on a shot for an ILM production? Um, well, it means that we will consume assets uh, from the ILM pipeline, uh, it means that we will artistically light the shot, um, and then we will, uh, we will output renders um, that are consumable by the compositors. Uh, so let's, let's break that down a little further. Uh, what, what, what do we mean by, by asset? That's kind of a loaded term too. Um, there, there are many, many, many types of assets, and uh, each, each type of asset is often represented by many, many, many individual files. Um, so for this Rogue One work specifically, uh, the, the assets and file types that we're dealing with um, are animated geometry caches, uh, paint and look dev data, um, cameras, background plates, virtual set geometry, and uh, captured HDRI lighting spheres uh, from, from set. Uh, as an ILM CG asset, uh, K2SO himself comes to us in two primary components. Um, the geometry stored in an Alembic container and the paint and look dev data represented in a Material X description. Alembic is an extremely powerful and extensible open standard uh, for transporting geometry between software packages, uh, born out of a partnership between Industrial Light and Magic and Sony Imageworks. Um, if you're curious about Alembic, you can learn more at uh, alembic.io. Uh, Material X is a new open standard um, that has come out of the Advanced Development Group and Industrial Light and Magic, uh, which allows material and texture information to be transported between different software packages and renderers. Material X is a key component of our unified assets standards. Um, it allows us to transfer unified shading descriptions uh, between all of our packages, between paint packages like Mari, um, look dev packages like Katana, uh, other DCCs such as Maya or our own internal tool Xeno, um, and even other platforms entirely like game engines. Um, if you're interested in Material X, uh, please check out materialx.org. Adding support for Material X and Alembic to, into the ADG version of the Unreal Engine uh, was one of the major technical undertakings of this Rogue One project, um, which Natty, Natty will go into more detail there, but the key takeaway here is that um, because these standards um, are both so easily extendable, we were able to take assumptions that are baked into ILM's production implementations uh, and reformat the, the, the asset data to be suitable for, for a real-time case like, uh, like Unreal. So by the time ADG got our first K2SO uh, turnover, the asset was basically complete at ILM. We had gone from, from these paintings um, to Landis had, had made uh, this digital asset. Um, here we are looking at the control cage for a creased subdivision surface. Uh, there are 600,000 some odd vertexes in the control cage alone um, with edge creases that go up to level four. Uh, so that means that for an extreme close-up on one of those creased edges, um, if you were to, to uniformly subdivide 
the, uh, the entire cage, you'll end up with 600,000 times four to the fourth or somewhere in the neighborhood of 154 million vertexes um, required in order to properly hold those creased edges. Uh, fortunately, none of the shots that we were dealing with um, required this extreme case. Uh, we also have 1,700 separate geometries in the animation hierarchy and uh, 63 UDEMs across 10 texture effects um, with most of those textures stored at 4K resolution, um, all driving uh, look dev in the unified shading model shared between Lucasfilm and ILM, um, which we call Unified Surf. So each and every component of K2SO, uh, every little piston and ring fitting, um, each of them can and does animate. So this is the beauty for us of the, uh, the Olympic cache. Um, we don't have to be able to evaluate that, that animation control rig at runtime um, when we're rendering in the game engine. We just consume the transforms uh, from a baked geometry cache. Uh, here's another view where you can see in his shoulders the, all the little pistons, um, how they move from, from his arms moving. And his knees and, and wrists and elbows, um, every, every little bit inside uh, uh, has, has moving parts. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, K2's Material X look dev data uh, has textures for, for driving 10 effects in, uh, in the unified shader. Um, that includes texture data for, uh, for a second specular lobe, um, and actually a third. Uh, but at the, the time of this Rogue One work, um, ADG's real-time implementation of unified surf uh, only supported a single specular lobe. So for, for the shots that ADG contributed to the film, um, the lighting and look dev TD, Justin Schubert, uh, had to dial in a custom specular look uh, 4K2 that mixes the spec one and spec two effects. John wasn't exactly thrilled about this, but the results looked good enough, and so we powered through. Um, here we see a comparison between the two lobe uh, render man renders on the left and uh, the results of Justin's efforts on the ADG render on the right. I mean, obviously it's not the same shot and not the same lighting setup, so we, we get away with it, right? So now that we have the, uh, the K2 asset, um, the CG asset for K2 himself, uh, we've brought in the Alembic of the camera, we have the EXR textures of the, uh, the background plates and of the lighting spheres uh, imported into Unreal as HDRI lighting environments. Um, now we can get to work actually uh, lighting the shot. So here we have some screen capture footage of uh, a contrived version of an interactive lighting session um, because we didn't actually capture any of this while we were doing the work. Um, uh, so you can see what, what the, the interactive lighting session would look like. Um, I should mention here that for games industry veterans such as yourselves, uh, real-time lighting is something that we kind of take for granted, right? Um, but real-time light and shadow feedback uh, on a full resolution, high fidelity industrial light and magic asset uh, with all 63 UDEMs of 4K textures and however many millions of vertexes slammed into the GPU. Um, seeing this kind of, of real-time light and shadow feedback uh, was, was revelatory for ILM lighting artists. Um, I should also mention that uh, at, at industrial light magic, um, you know, the concept of CG lighting, uh, that means area lighting. Um, and area lights means textured area lights, uh, as in a, a high dynamic range photograph of a uh, taken on location of an actual physical light source that was illuminating actors and props and sets. Uh, at ADG, we have some approximated area lighting shaders for surface shading. Um, we have basic rectangles and discs and also the standard unreal spheres and pills. Um, but we, we, we don't have textured area lights. Uh, one important addition also is that area lights at ILM means area shadows, and that one is uh, an even tougher pill to swallow. Um, once again, Justin was able to hack his way to the visual result that satisfied um, uh, production for Rogue One by dialing in a tunable filter radius on, uh, on standard PCF shadow maps. Um, yeah, at, at this point, I'll, I'll pass it off to Natty to, uh, to dive into some technical details of rendering. Thanks, Roger. So um, Unreal Engine now has some support for loading Alembic files, but we needed an implementation that could handle ILM Alembic files. As uh, Roger touched on earlier, Alembic is a very flexible and extensible format, 
and ILM took full advantage of this extensibility and has extended it quite far. One of the ADG engineers, Ron Radetzky, did significant work to enable our pipeline to take in this highly extended Alembic format and turn it into vertex buffers that could be directly uploaded and consumed by the GPU. After animation happens on the ILM pipe, in the ILM pipeline, <clears throat> a bake take uh, is cached out in an Alembic file. This is a vertex cache of that final animated result. The bake take is a pure geometry cache. It's baked every frame. It has no information on the rig or deformers or anything like that. It's all baked out for that one frame. Um, K2SO is mostly rigid. And um, so, so, so uh, most of that cache is rigid transforms. There's a, a, a small amount of uh, kind of bendy bits, basically his antenna. They are very small compared to the rest of him. And um, in these particular shots, I'm not even sure they animated uh, at all. So it, you could basically think of it as a very complex, rigid setup with a lot of rigid pieces. ILM geometry caches contain subdivision surfaces as well as traditional polygon meshes. So Ron's implementation had to deal with both. For the subdivision surfaces at the time of the Rogue One work, we determined that we only needed to render at subdivision level two in order to hit the visual quality target. We did some tests at level three, but for these specific shots and cameras, level two was quite sufficient. This allowed us to pre-subdivide the entire mesh in main memory. And this was the most straightforward. It wasn't the most elegant or the most performant way, but it was definitely the most straightforward way to shim this data into Unreal, given the film schedule that we had to work with. Now, all of the subdivision surface rendering is built on a foundation of the open standard from Pixar, Open Subdiv. For Rogue One, we did subdivision on the CPU. Open Subdiv does have a GPU implementation, and we took a look at it, but we found that it has some problem cases with UV texture coordinate data, and it doesn't work well on ILM assets like K2SO. In the Epic keynote this morning, Epic announced Open Subdiv support in Unreal Engine. This implementation, of course, didn't exist when this work was uh, ongoing, but we look forward to evaluating it for possible use in future projects. Rendering K2 is so uniformly subdivided level two was quite stressful for even our, our most powerful machines. As Roger pointed out earlier, every subdivision level is multiplying the polygon count by four. So uh, Ron, who was working on the uh, Alembic and subdivision uh, part of the, of the engine, thought there must be a smarter way to go about this. So in parallel to the Rogue One work, Ron developed a streaming Alembic solution that did not require subdividing everything up in memory ahead of time. And he also developed a curvature-based recursive reduction algorithm for removing redundant spans on subdivided surfaces, as you can see in the slide. The, um, the end result is quite a bit simpler. Using the redundant span loop reduction method, Ron is able to render a version of K2 that is visually indistinguishable from the full level three tessellation, all while maintaining a constant 60 hertz frame rate. While we did not get to take advantage of this on the Rogue One work, we continue to enjoy this advancement for our current projects. In addition to subdivision surfaces, another facet of our Alembic geometry cache consumption is handling the motion blur time samples, which is a specific aspect of ILM's flavor of Alembic. ILM's geometry caches include motion blur samplers, samples at three times for each frame when the sh camera shutter opens, when the camera shutter closes, and the time in the middle. This includes full data for all the geometry, any cameras that might be moving, for each of these three points in time for each frame. Ron's implementation enables us to do temporal supersampling by interpolating the camera and geometry positions between, in between those three subframe samples. For the Rogue One shots, we rendered out images at 64 different times spread over each frame. This is, of course, computationally quite heavy, but we needed to do this if we wanted to get motion blur that was up to ILM standards. We get some additional use out of these renders by also jittering the camera at the same time using a Halton sequence. This also gets us spatial supersampling at the same cost. We have some ideas for applying these uh, samples in another dimension, for example, area light sources as well in the future. Before we talk about rendering, we should talk about compositing, which is the process where the final image is actually put together by a specialized CG artist, a digital compositor. It bears some resemblances to the post-effects passes that we get in uh, game renderers. 
various blue, blurs, blings, blooms, flares, all of these effects happen in, in comp or in the composition phase, composite phase. And uh, this would be no different for our shots, just like every other shot in the film. So we needed to be able to get uh, our ADG renders output and handed over in a way that is seamless and transparent to the compositor. At ILM, TD renders are handed off to the compositor in open EXR format. While Unreal does come off the shelf with EXR output capability, in, in that feature, the image is written before certain post-process effects happen, and that those include, unfortunately, some lighting features. And we needed to output the full lid and shaded beauty render in an EXR container. That was a fairly trivial change to make in our version of Unreal Engine. So we render motion blur, but the depth-based defocus blur occurs in, in the comp phase. And this is true also for the ILM renders. We knew that we needed to have an extremely robust motion blur result in order to pass muster with John. We also needed to be able to output depth so that the compositor could have control over the depth of field in the final output. The concept of arbitrary output variables is a staple of offline rendering and compositing at ILM and at other uh, feature film houses. Uh, these AOVs are output by the renderer, and they are used during the compositing phase. On the surface, these images are somewhat similar to G buffers that you might have in a deferred shading engine. <coughs> One key difference between uh, G buffers and uh, the AOVs, the A stands for and really does mean arbitrary. These values can be stored from any point in the shading computation. It can be even some intermediate value that is only present during a particular uh, subphase of the shading calculation. And to generate that kind of arbitrary output from any point of the shading math in a game engine render would require a lot of plumbing. So we identified a minimum set of AOVs that the compositor would need for our specific shots. Depth is one example of an arbitrary output variable that we're e we were easily able to accommodate. Ideally, this exercise would result in less compositing work than traditional ILM shot, since something closer to the final result would be visible to the lighting artist interactively. So we were able to get away with three AOVs for most of our shots. The beauty are GBA, which is basically the final rendered color. We have the depth, which I mentioned earlier, and an object ID uh, buffer. Some shots or AOV. Some, a few shots required a fourth AOV, which was an em emissive mat. Rogue One was an ACES CG show at ILM. At the time that this work was done with an ADG, our version of Unreal was still limited to the sRGB or Rec. 709 color gamut. This was another area where ADG and ILM had some creative back and forth in order to ensure that the Rec. 709 renders out of ADG fit correctly into the Rogue One ASUS CG color pipeline. So, now that we are able to ingest the assets and do creative work interactively, and we have some baseline capability in place for all of these various technical features, we're ready to render, but what does rendering for feature film visual effects actually mean? To quote ILM visual effects supervisor Ben Snow, in computer graphics, a lot of the time we're trying to reproduce the reality that the viewer sees with their own eyes in the world around them, but with visual effects or film, we're really trying to reproduce filmed reality, which is a little bit different. So what does it mean to make things look like a photograph or like a, a frame from a film? Well, arguably, one of the most significant components is to have absolutely no visible aliasing. The ILM render resolution for Rogue One was 4K, but for us to be able to kill all aliasing in, in our ADG renders, we had to use a combination of the jittered supersampling that I described earlier and the uniform supersampling, effectively rendering the frame at a higher resolution. So for our final, final output uh, for com compositing into the uh, movie, we ended up rendering at 9K in addition to the 64 jittered uh, subpixel samples I mentioned. Here we see a portion of our beauty pass for this frame at a one to one pixel scale. Even with all of those samples, our shots were rendering at just about exactly one minute per frame. That render time is due to several factors. First of all, it was 9K resolution and it was rendering effectively 64 times or 64 subsamples per pixel. And also a significant portion of the uh, frame time was due to massive file I.O. and memory transfers, since we're talking about extremely large uh, output files, and we're talking also about extremely large input files in the case of Alembic. This shot is one of the first tests that we generated in order to show John what the results from a real-time render could look like. These renders were pretty far from real-time, of course, at about a minute per frame, but compared to multiple hours per frame, which the render man renders were taking, that's still quite a win. This is an example of a shot that was also done at ILM. So our work in this case was to match the ILM result. 
The ILM lighting setup used only three light sources. There was a rectangular area light for the ceiling panel, another rectangle for the back wall panel, and an overall HDRI sphere. Roger, who lit this shot on the ADG side, managed to stay true to that using our approximated rectangular area lights and fake soft, soft shadows. Screen space ambient occlusion was our only shadowing factor for the HDRI sphere. K2's eyes are a complex set of refractive lenses. We didn't support the unified surf refraction model for a transparent rendering in our real-time version of the unified shader, so the eyes proved a bit problematic for us. We ended up authoring a custom material, and uh, we did a custom uh, pass and, um, and ended up rendering it separately, and we got results that were close enough. Lighting to the Justin Schubert took over lighting duties on the ADG side, starting with this shot, an outdoor shot with K2 in the mid-background. We expected that with a single CG sun and an HDRI sphere, and with K2's eyes not dominating the frame, this would be a solid candidate for the ADG test. There you can see clearly both the rendered motion blur, as well as the defocus blur that was done in comp. The focus pull, using an exact emulation of Rogue One's complex and amorphic lens model, is done entirely in comp, using the depth mat, AOV output, along with ADG renders. These results were very promising and got a good response from John. We used CG geometry for the physical set to calculate occlusion and shadowing on K2 as he walked through the door. Additional darkening of K2 as he walked further inside was done in comp as a final bit of sweetening. This was the last test shot that we did before moving on to actual production work. This shot was working so well, we actually stopped work on it, uh, on the ADG version of it, before we had the chance to incorporate the final clean background plate uh, paintwork. This shot presented two primary lighting challenges. First of all, on the ILM side, the canvas canopies above and around K2 were presented as complex textured area lights. ILM, uh, ILM's lighting process extracts textured cards from the onset captured HDRI sphere using an internal tool within Xeno called Lightcraft. Also, the choreographed animated effects lighting from the explosion needed to be addressed. Our approach to the textured area lights was to take the HDR images from the ILM Lightcraft solve those textures can be seen here at the top of the screen, and place those textures on cards into the Unreal Scene for reference. Then Justin built a lighting rig out of non-textured approximated area lights to match the layout, shape, color, and intensity of the hotspots that uh, we should, should be getting from the original lighting textures. For the FX lighting animation, we didn't have matinee support for IDG Alembic animation system, and sequencer did not yet exist. So we had to choreograph all of this together via Unreal Blueprint scripts and timelines, which would be evaluated during the render process. Once again, for this shot as well, the results were very promising. We got this render of the K2SO element to the point that John said that he would have finaled it, leaving unsaid if I didn't already have this perfectly good final shot from ILM. We did get a great quote from John on the shot. This is the future. It was at this point that ADG director Hilmar Koch asked John if he would be comfortable now switching over to a no safety net approach for at least one shot in Rogue One. John agreed, and Rogue One CG supervisor Vic Schutz identified not one but three shots from a sequence that was slated to be finished in San Francisco. These are the three shots that ADG contributed to the film. This was the first of our production shots. Everything we've talked about so far really had to come together in order for this to work under real production deadlines with no ILM safety net. We tried gobos or slide maps for the imperial pill lights. At one point, we had a very clear pill pattern projected and reflected in K2's arms, but creative direction ended up going for a softer look. Also, the lighting change when emerging from the hallway into the larger chamber was challenging. Due to self-shadow artifacts with depth-based shadow maps, the top lighting scenario in the larger chamber took some tweaking on Justin's part in order to resolve all banding issues. This one was a fairly straightforward shot. This was the first shot where we realized the significance of the object ID mat, which is one of those three AOVs I mentioned earlier. This allowed the compositor, Dan Elstrom, to ensure that bright background elements came through the defocus blur correctly. This shot presented a challenge in that K2's self-bound sliding is obviously missing from our direct uh, dynamic lighting setup. K2's shoulders should be reflecting a lot of light up onto the back of his head, and with the global illumination path tracer, you can get that. In our case, we ended up cheating with bounce lights, parented under certain bits of the animation hierarchy, and keyframe during the shot, 
we used a similar timing sh setup for this that was used for the explosion effects lighting in the, previous, in the, the last test shot. This uh, sweeping camera really illustrates the weaknesses of our real-time implementation of the shading model. This was the one shot where our single specular lobe really started to limit us from reaching the approved or blessed K2 look. Justin had to do some, some shot-specific material tweaks to make some of the more reflective bits and bobs sing properly. We are thrilled that we were able to contribute to a project like Rogue One. The work of innovation in real-time rendering doesn't stop here, though. Current ADG and XLab projects in flight right now, such as the upcoming Vader VR project, demand continued advancement in both fidelity as well as performance, and we have a number of areas of active development. Area lights and shadows, support for Pixar's universal scene description format or USD format. We are excited by Epic's announcement of USD support this morning. Pushing our real-time subdivision surface rendering techniques further, incorporating open color I.O., supporting true arbitrary output variables during rendering, and continuing to improve our real-time implementation of Unified Surf. In closing, I'd like to take this opportunity to give a huge shout out and thanks to the rest of the team who made this work possible over the past year. David Many, Nick Haynes, Indy Ray, Vic Schatz, Dan Enstrom, Just Justin Schubert, Ron Radetzky, and Hannah Gillis. And we have some time for Q&A. And by the way, ILM, ILM XLab, and the Lucasfilm Advanced Development Group are all hiring. And Sarah, our XLab recruiter, is here in the room. Please stand up and wave, Sarah. There she is. And thank you. Yes. So uh, our, our area lighting shaders are, um, uh, so we ended up using both techniques uh, for some shots. We, because render time did not have to be, um, you know, we weren't making a game to run at 60 hertz. We had uh, multiple seconds to render these images. Uh, uh, I don't know if you sure. want to talk about the lighting rigs that you built that were using many, many, many <laughs> lights. Yeah, yeah sure. So uh, we definitely used clusters of lights, uh, basically old school point light technique of like, casting a bunch of shadows, getting soft lighting from multiple shadow samples. Um, worked, but it was extremely expensive, way too expensive. Um, so basically, I uh, kind of went over to Roger, I was like, what do I do? Uh, I had basically a day to figure it out. Um, what I ended up doing in the long run was taking uh, the PCF shadows that exist in Unreal and putting a multiplier against its depth, or its depth sampling, and then uh, that in tandem, like that, was then uh, I implemented a slider into the lights. Uh, and another guy that I work with, Prasher, uh, Christian Maturi, uh, helped me on that effort. Um, very good guy. Uh, anyway, so in tandem with that, cranking the bias, uh, I was able to actually shorten my depth and get softer shadow uh, spread, which ended up actually looking fairly nice. So. Um, no, I think that pretty much covered it. Lights are pretty bright, I can't see. Oh, yes. Uh, you mentioned that you use streets by street space and in the studio. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that simply darkening the frame buffer, or did you do something more than that? No, it was, uh, you would know the details, but I believe it was applied uh, in this being shots. being applied to, to specific light only. lights, yeah. To, so the question was about screen space ambient inclusion and whether we are applying it to, um, to the entire, to the final image or, and the answer is no, we're using it as a shadowing factor, as an occlusion factor for specific um, lights, light types which had no other shadow calculated. Uh, mainly, like, really the only light that is shadowed by that is the, um, the environment sphere because we have no other shadow term to pull from that. Yes. Um, I noticed that you uh, had certain vi uh, visual effects elements in some of the shots as well. Uh, for example, sand kicking up from K2SO's feet, and in the X-Wing shots there was all the water uh, vapor and everything. 
Did you also render those in UE4? And if so, how did you approach those? No, 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 no. That's all in the composite. Okay. Uh, so the, the X-Wings are that, that specific element. That's what was rendered in, in the real-time game engine. Um, and again, that rendering those X-Wings fast, uh, even just rendering the X-Wings takes multiple hours in RenderMan. So that, that was a win for us there. And on Rogue One, it was specifically the, the K2SO element that goes into composite. Right. So the explosion, um, I mean, actually in that shot, that was a practical, that was photographed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the smoke and dust, those are 2D elements that are just done in compositing. And the same with the sand kicking up? That was yeah, the sand kicking up uh, um, actually was in the plate because uh, oh, Alan Tudyk right. was performing K2 in a motion capture suit, so that he was actually kicking up sand, and we, that was retained when oh, it was painted out. Thank you. Yep. Ha, what kind of uh, global illumination approaches are you thinking about using for the future? I think your mic is your mic. mic. Um, oh yeah, I guess I can answer from here. Um, yeah, so there's uh, there are various uh, Global, mostly pre-computed or baked global illumination solutions uh, that you can use within within Unreal. You can bake uh, light maps. You can bake uh, diffuse indirect probes. You can bake uh, IBLs from w within uh, within uh, light mass, which is Unreal's baked lighting tool. Uh, in terms of uh, more dynamic GI, um, we intend to sort of address that as as we run as we run into the problem because there is a lot of different ways you can skin that uh, particular issue and. Um, I think the, pr the, the form in which we first encounter a need to solve it will kind of drive the approach that we take. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, quick question. Um, so uh, in comparison to the approach that you've taken, um, what's your opinions on like GPU path tracers, like for example, like uh, popular ones like Octane, Render, or FStorm? these kind of up-and-coming GPU path tr tracers that are basically using the GPU to render frames really, really fast. Like, have you exper experimented with that? And like, what, what are the kind of comparisons with that approach? So, so I, I certainly don't want to speak for John, but for me, uh, I, the, the fact that the image is resolved fully um, and there is no, no uh, 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 um, convergence, progressive convergence uh, during, during interactive editing, um, that even though things are wrong, that's a, that's a, a win for rasterization in my case. Um, for the lighting artist to be able to see an image that is, uh, that is very, very, very close to what the final image is going to be um, in, you know, completely interactively and in fluid real time during working with no, uh, no shift, no convergence required, um, that's, that seems huge. I, I thought that uh, movie companies were rendering uh, their graphics with Maya and programs like that. Now you're doing it with Unreal Engine. Why is that? Well, most of the uh, shots in the movie were rendered with other tools than Unreal Engine. And uh, I know the full list is probably quite long. I guess there's the mainstream pipeline. Yeah, I mean, the majority of the, uh, the renders on the show are, uh, are RenderMan RIS renders. Uh, a lot of the environment work is uh, rendered in V-Ray. Uh, then a lot of uh, effects elements, uh, smoke and fire and that sort of thing. I think a lot of those are mantra renders, along with a uh, uh, fair number that were done in, in Plume, an in-house package we've written. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty big mixture of different techniques. But the your question about why, uh, why real-time, why GPU renders, uh, was really about, uh, about iteration time, about uh, looking at, uh, at looking to the future where Ideally, we're, we're letting artists uh, really see what they're doing and, uh, and be able to, to reduce that iteration cycle down to, to seconds. I think uh, we get down to uh, being able to hit feature film level quality with renders that can, are interactive, so you can move lights around, you can, uh, you can make uh, material adjustments uh, pretty much in real time. That, that does shave quite a lot off of the, uh, the amount of time that goes into developing an asset or Time is money. <laughs> um, do you see a trade-off between the man hours that is required to prepare a shot for the real time versus just sending it off to the render farm? Um, 
yeah. th that was one of the, the requirements of this exercise was that um, there, we weren't allowing ourselves any, any custom preparation of the content that goes into these shots. We had to be able to consume the content directly from, from the fire hose of the ILM pipeline, and, uh, and that's what we executed. Yeah, I mean, certainly we could have made the job uh, in some ways easier for ourselves by authoring something that, that's performant in the, in the engine. Uh, but the, for me, a big part of the point of this exercise was we don't, don't want to do any special, we're going to rebuild it for, for Unreal. No, we're going to take uh, one of our, our standard production assets kind of as they are normally built for RenderMan and we're going to hand it off to ADG and they're going to render it and make it look beautiful. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. As these uh, processes become more and more real time, I can't help wondering if you've spent any time anticipating what will become of the artist experience. Uh, I remember from my own time at ILM that a given asset might take 15, 20, 30 artists working on it. Do you see any of these processes, these uh, improvements in render time and interactivity, altering that experience for those individual artists? And if so, how? Well, I, I suppose some of the things I, I see happening are uh, one artist being able to do more work. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to the day when, um, when you can have a, a handful of artists uh, kind of do whole sequences. Is it like you're getting closer to citizen, you know, like a real-time performance? Yeah, I, it, it's, you know, and a lot of it comes down to just iteration. You know, you, you usually it takes... Uh, five, six takes uh, on, on lighting renders to, to really get things dialed in. But uh, if you don't have to wait for an overnight render and look to, to see it in the theater, if you can make a tweak and just see what you're going to get, I think you can get there a lot quicker. And economics are huge in this business. So anything that allows you to do very high quality work and put fewer man hours into it. Um, I had a question specifically about just uh, motion blur. I'm curious why you decided to do that in engine rather than kicking that to comp as well, where it seems like you might be able to get a little bit smoother result rather than just kicking it out 16 times in Unreal. Uh, that was specifically because that's the way it is rendered at ILM, that the compositing setup for these shots, like the compositor who's working on these shots is also compositing a ton of other shots that did not come from ADG. Right. And so he's used to renders coming to him with motion blur in them, and so we were... We stuck with that. So rather yeah. than running like a vector pass or something like that, you just figured that would be the way to do it. Well, also, um, that would require, like in order to have a, a motion blur technique that we could render out, um, we would have to in, invent one <laughs> that is as, uh, as high quality as what um, you can do with the, the temporal and spatial subsamples right. in the Olympic. I uh, just figured for those three specific shots or something like that, where the motion is rather linear, you're not dealing with anything, any crazy motions. Yeah, I, technically, uh, we probably could have rendered without blur and done a, done a 2D vector thing. Um, but, you know, I wasn't, wasn't trying to give them an easy way out on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, you know, we, we have sometimes resorted to doing uh, uh, motion vector renders uh, uh, you know, to save on render time or, you know, to reduce noise. Um, and it can look good in plenty of cases, but it's sort of technically wrong. And there are always pathological cases where it just doesn't work at all, yeah. like uh, you know, spinning propellers and things like that. Cool. Uh, so I think, in general, that the preference, the culture at ILM is to try and get it more technically right and just let it grind a little bit longer on the, on the farm. Gotcha, thanks. Hi, um, so obviously you had to pick and choose your battles here um, and there are some compromises you had to be willing to make um, to get you know good enough but still run close enough to real time that it would meet your, your requirements. But um, what, do you, what do you see as like uh, the prospects for being able to start handling more more broad cases, like not just as restricted as you're kind of currently having to be. So, so the the work that that Natty and his group are are um, doing right now will um, lift a lot of the restrictions on the types of assets that we would even consider tackling at all. Um, you know, having a full version of the unified shader implemented in real time. Uh, there will no longer be uh, a reason 
to pick a certain asset over another. Um, most of the compromise that we made from the what was real time and then what was a minute of frame was all about aliasing. Um, so for for the lighting artist working in in real time at his desk, it is it's an aliased image, but it's a real time image. And so uh, if we can consume the geometry caches from ILM and we can shade them with the shading model that ILM uses, uh, and it's a slightly aliased image, then I think. Uh, so you, we'll be in business. So you think you're on a roadmap to be able to handle non-hard surfaces even? Well, r roadmap is a pretty abstract uh, <laughs> description of that. Yeah, more arbitrary hard surfaces is a good first one. Um, once you're talking about things with uh, subsurface scattering, it's definitely something that we've been looking into, but that is obviously a trickier one to do at sort of ILM visual standards. Right. right. Yeah, I think just getting support for the second specular lobe and, uh, and for the uh, uh, we'll do them in refraction order. and uh, uh, mm -hmm. reflection model, I think, uh, you know, opens things up pretty considerably. Yeah, the second specular lobe we already have in, in, our, um, in our latest work and uh, refraction, uh, we've definitely been investigating that as well. Really good looking soft area lights too. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, and uh, we have some good ideas for that. Who benefits from, from this uh, art uh, real-time rendering. Is it just somebody who sees K2 and he can look at it or does the compositor have everything composed it and edit it in real life and see how things change? Well, in terms of the, um, the pipeline, I guess that would be well, for you. Yeah, I, somebody who's, who's done a lot of, uh, of sort of offline software rendering, um, you know, I've suffered through the, the bad old days where you would tweak a parameter and you'd, you'd dispatch a test and you'd, you know, wait 15 minutes to see a little postage stamp version to, to see. And it's, it's uh, you know, when your iteration times are fairly long like that, uh, you know, there's only so much finesse you can afford to put into a shot before you basically run out of, out of time. And so the faster you can get the iteration loop, then the better you can make something look. You can kind of dial something to be just so. And you can do much more high quality finished work you know, on, on take one. So the, you know, the goal here is to reduce the, the number of takes that are required and how long an artist uh, has to work to, to get a satisfactory result. And letting, letting an artist get more work done means you know, there's in total fewer man hours that go into a given project. So it makes the, the work less expensive to do. And, uh, you know, there's less of a chance that it all goes to third world countries. Yeah, to piggyback off of what John's saying too, uh, the process was very WYSIWYG. Like, what you see is what you get. It's right there, it's fluid, you can light. What you see is what you get at the end. Like, there is no iteration in between. Uh, the only effect that you're not getting is like proper anti-aliasing, uh, the motion blur, but the rest of the shot, if you have a backplate behind the thing, it, you can light to that backplate and get your final result in viewport. Uh, so that's also the benefit, that's the primary benefit of this tool, right? Um, I could have like Vic shuts, for instance, at my desk saying I need another point light over here, I need some extra spec on his shoulder, and I can just drop that in there and look at it, and he can approve it, and I can say, okay, now I send it off and render out the samples. So that, that benefit for the artist flows upward all the way. I mean, John benefits from this, getting more yeah. useful takes in dailies every day. That's I'll say, I've shot a lot of live action too, uh, both you know, live action things and miniatures. And I, I'm also very used to a kind of different workflow. When you're on set and you're lighting something, you, know, you see how, the, how everything responds in real time. And, and you'll have somebody kind of move in a light and you'll watch how the shadows fall on a character and you sort of slide things around until oh yeah, that's, that's feeling about right. And you know, much slower software renders, it's, it's, a, it's a very different workflow. You kind of take a guess at it and you, and having a tool where you can drag things around in real time is sort of replicating a bit of that, that onset experience. And I, I think that changes a little bit how you think about lighting. Thanks. So for GPUs, I'm curious, did you guys use the um, Consumer 980 or Titan, or did you go the Workstation Quadro type route or something else altogether? So we were using, uh, yeah, we use Quadros. Okay, cool. Hey, uh, so you have added uh, UDIM support to Unreal? Or? 
Um, we, we, we added Material X support to Unreal, which kind of brings UDEMs with it, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you.